And how many think that your children are special? Amen. If your hands are not up, I'm going to come and tell your children. <laughs> your parents didn't raise their hands. So you think your children are special? Amen. I wonder where you got that. I wonder where you got that idea. That that thing that God blessed you with in those children through the act of procreation was going to be this amazing blessing that came into your life. And it was going to bless you, and it was going to test you, and it was going to be the greatest thing and the worst thing and the most wonderful, wonderful thing at times. But it was going to be something that you thought your children were great no matter what they did. Even when they were wrong, you still loved them, didn't you? So I'm going to go through a series, to, and it's, the series is called Chosen. The series is called Chosen. So I want to go to start with Joshua for our reading today. We're going to read about four scriptures. How many know that there's not a sermon I can preach that if it's not grounded in God's Word, there's no point in having the sermon? For me to come up here and philosophize and rationalize and tickle ears, that God says that's a waste of your time. You know, you, might, you might, might as well go down and watch a movie or something. But if I'm going to give you something that's important, it has to be based on the precious, mighty Word of God. So let's start in Joshua. And God is dealing with Joshua as a man, as a leader, and, and with the nation of Israel. So they're getting ready to go into the promised land. And God tells Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, let's start in verse 6. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for inheritance the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. That thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. And this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Everybody say good success. Good success. Oh, mine has a footnote here, though. Unless COVID-19 takes over, then there's nothing God can do. My Bible says that God can bless you in this process. If we live according to His laws and His word, God can bless you in this mess we're living in right now today. That's what my Bible tells me. That's what your Bible tells you, that God is above the things of this earth. And we learn that in the series. So turn to Isaiah 46. God has a plan for your life. In spite of everything that's gone on, God has not been derailed. His plans for your life have not been derailed. So Isaiah 46, and this is another one of those verses that unless you read the Bible through every two or three years, you might not read this. And God is dealing with Israel in relation to their idolatry. And God literally tells them, he says, I'm going to tell you, he said, let, let, let me ask you, this is literally what he asked him. He said, you serve in idols, how's that working out for you? That's honestly what God is asking right here. How's that working out for you? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's what God told them. So God says, I want a consecration of the men of Israel. And he says in verse number 8, Remember this, and show yourselves men. Everybody say men. men. Bring it again to mind, O ye transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. God said, there's no God like me. And then he's going to explain why he is so different than other gods. He said, Remember the former things, for I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from the ancient of times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all that my pleasure. So God said, There's no other God that prophesies the end from the beginning. There's no other God that operates like me. And he says, Why are you serving these gods? They can't hear you, if you have to go back and you read that. He said, they can't, they're, they're not obedient. They can't hear you. They have no idea what you're talking about. And he says, You serve these gods, carry them around. And, and he said, This is what you're worshiping? He said, they can't even tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. Right. So God says, I want you to know I'm a different God. I, there's no God like me. Say, there's no God like our God. No God like our God. And God said, I'm serious about you understanding there's no God like our God. The reality is sometimes when you go through difficult things in life, we start looking for different answers. But I'm going to here to tell you there's no other answer any other place than in our God. He's the answer for all our issues and problems. In Ephesians chapter 1... 
I want you to know that God has been thinking about you a long time. You're not somebody that just came up on the radar when you were conceived. So I want to read the scripture here. Paul says, I, I pray that you understand this. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Jesus Christ, or Christ. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Everybody say, God's been thinking about me for a long time. God has been thinking about you for a long time. That right there says before the foundation of the world. The only other thing that says before the foundation of the world is the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. I'm here to tell you today, God has been thinking about you as long as he's been thinking about Jesus Christ becoming the Lamb of God to save the whole world. That's how long God's been thinking about you. It, does your Bible say that? Let me read it again. Maybe, maybe my Dake's Bible is wrong. According as he has chosen us, or in him before the foundation of the world. Man, he's been thinking about I've been on God's radar a long time. You've been on God's radar a long time. Woo! Hallelujah! God's been thinking about me as long as he's been thinking about Christ. Wow! Somebody shout amen before I go nuts here. My goodness. Say, I've been on God's radar a long time. Wow. How long? Wow. Before the foundation of the world, God knew me. Woo! How many think your kids are special? God thinks you're extra special. God thinks you're so special. He's been thinking about you since eons. Wow! That's what your Bible says. That's what I just read to you. You can go home right now and be blessed with the Word of God I just read you right now. I don't have to say one more thing, but I'm going to. I don't have to say one more thing to preach to you today. That you leave here knowing God's been thinking about me a long time. My goodness. 1 Peter 2.9 says that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, set apart. God said, the Bible, and King James says peculiar. That, 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 that's a weird reading. It, it, it's, it's really set apart, where God's own possession is what that means. Say, I'm God's own possession. God's own possession. So that's our, our reading for today. And I just want you to remember how special your children are. Because to God, you are special. So, to start this sermon today, I, I want to go back to creation. And in creation, God created birds to fly, right? He said, I've made the heavens for the birds. So, if birds don't fly, God's word is a lie. And God's reputation and character are on the line. So, that's why birds fly, because God said they're supposed to fly. That's what he said. He said, I made the seas for the fish. That's why fish swim in the oceans and in the waters. Because God said, this is what I have made. This is the law that I have put in them. This is the way they ought to live. You never see a fish that, that voluntarily wants to just come out of the water. All the fish that I get, I have to coax out some way. Okay? They don't just automatically bite it. I have to kind of trick them. So, God's reputation is at stake in relation to the way that he sets something up and performs it. He puts his laws of nature into that animal or into that fish. Do you realize if you get an acorn and you put it in the ground, what's going to grow out of that? An oak tree. But if you get an acorn and you set it right here and you leave it here for 50 years, guess what? If you come back 50 years from now, guess what will happen? It'll be an acorn sitting right here. Because the laws that God put in it said it will not grow until it gets soil and moisture and sunlight. So even nature understands that God has laws and they operate by those laws. In God's wisdom, he has built everything into laws to guarantee its success. To guarantee its success. God's laws are to guarantee success in our lives. So God is not mean. He's not a mean father. His laws are to guarantee. What did God tell Joshua? If you obey my laws and the laws that I gave Moses, you will have what kind of success? Good success. Everybody say good success. Good success. This is God's word. So the acorn is smart enough to know. I'm not going to try to grow here on this tile or on this carpet. Why is it that animals and, and seeds are smarter than we as humans? <laughs> well, why? You're not going to grow in a bar. I'm just going to tell you, you're not going to grow in a bar. Does you understand what I'm saying now? Why are animals and seeds and birds smarter than we are? Why is it us that always test the laws of God? 
So whenever you operate by the laws of God, I'm going to make a statement, and it's a declarative statement, and I believe this, you will not need to pray for the things God's laws deliver naturally and supernaturally. Amen. Think about that. God is a God of principle and law. And God said, if you obey my commands, Joshua, he said, you're going to have good success. And he doesn't say you're going to have to pray for it. He says, you're going to have good success if you obey my laws and my principles. Right? He didn't say you're going to have to pray, you're going to have to fast, you're going to have to do all these things. He said, just be obedient to God's laws and see what happens naturally and supernaturally in your life. Oh, that's a hallelujah right there. If I'm obedient to God, I'm going to have good success? My goodness, that's a, that, I, I, that, that just, that's a revelation right there, and it changed my life. So when you operate by the laws of God, it will reduce your prayer time. It will reduce your prayer time. And you don't have to pray for things God delivers through His Word. Automatically. Okay? Okay. How many had children and you, had, you gave your children chores? Mm-hmm. And in my house, if they got their chores done, they got... What's it called? An allowance. So did they, their, their chores, they got their allowance. It was a natural process. Make your bed, clean your bedroom, do what mom tells you, wash the dishes. That was a bad one for my... I, man, I don't know what it is with dishes. But then there is a blessing that comes with obedience to the Word. Right? God, God, that's, we got that from God, brothers and sisters. So let me ask you something. When you buy a car and it was made by the manufacturer, they gave you a book. A manual for your vehicle, didn't they? The manufacturer's guide for that truck, for that vehicle. I say truck because that's what a man drives, a truck. That's what my father taught me. That's, that's just what it is. <laughs> all right. You all figure that out. But when you bought a car, they, they had a manufacturer's manual came with that. And that manufacturer, all of the laws of that manufacturer's manual are in that vehicle, Right? So the laws for correct function of the vehicle are in the manufacturer's manual. So you don't need to pray about what kind of back gas to put in your car, do you? You get the manual and you read the manual and the manual says put in unleaded gas only. The manual says put in unleaded gas only. The manual says put in unleaded gas only. So you don't need to pray. You don't need to ask God. You can read the manual. It says unleaded gas. I'm going to put unleaded gas in and the car will function properly and correctly. Right? right. Now if you like orange juice and, or you like iced tea, which I do, and you think, you know what? I'm going to put orange juice in there. I'm going to put iced tea in there. Is the tar going to correct functionally? Is it going to work right? No. Because the manufacturer's manual tells you exactly what to put in that vehicle. God's Word tells you exactly what you and I are supposed to do and put in us, put in our mind, put in our spirit. God's Word is a manufacturing guide for our life because God manufactured you. And I'm going to get deeper into this today, and I'm just going to let you know, none of you got here by the stork. There not, a stork did not bring one of you here. There was an event that happened that you became a person. Now, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So, we need to understand, in other words, you don't bring the laws of the manufacturer and tell them, I don't like your laws. I want to put orange juice in my car, do you? We don't bring that to the manufacturer, so why do we bring to God when he has a manufacturer's manual, something other than what he has asked us or told us to do? And animals don't have a problem with this. Seed does not have a problem with this. Men are the only one that has a problem with this. Here's your manufacturer's manual. And I promise you it will tell you exactly what to do with every situation of life. So we don't go to the manufacturer and say, hey, I don't like that. I want to run my car on orange juice. I want to run my car on something differently. The manual and the manufacturer have said this is the law for the vehicle. So God's laws produce good success in our life. God's laws are not meant to penalize you. They're meant to bless you. Amen. So God has designed everything to function by law. Everything functions by law in God's kingdom. The way the sun and the moon and the stars operate, it all functions by the word of God and what he has spoken. In the Ten Commandments, God gave the laws. But what's amazing is he gave the laws, but he didn't explain them. 
That's interesting to me. He gave the laws, but he didn't explain them. On my wife's iron, you know what it says? Don't operate near water. <laughs> That's what the manufacturer said. It said that, but then it didn't explain that. As an electrician, I completely understand why you should not do that. But, you know, the manufacturers, they just give orders. So God said, I shall have, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And as you go through the list of the Ten, ten Commandments, you look at what God said. And he doesn't have, I got news for you. God doesn't have to explain what will bless you. What will take care of you? What will take, protect you? God says, if you just be obedient to my word, I'm the manufacturer, do this. And we as humans always have to question, why? Have you ever questioned God's laws? God's laws are given for your success. And manufacturers, they don't explain it, they just announce it. And we as humans, sometimes we just can't resist testing the manufacturer's laws and handbook. God designed fish to be in water, so fish will never leave the water. They're smarter than humans. Birds are designed to find air so they don't try to be fish. So we as humans, we test the manufacturer's manual. That seed, I promise you, if you set an acorn on this, on this carpet or on the tile out there, and you come back 20 years from now, that seed will just be sitting there. Because the law in the seed says, I don't have soil, I don't have water, I don't have sunlight, I won't do anything until what God says works will happen. That's when I will become a tree. How can a seed be smarter than us humans? Whew, I'm, I'm preaching better than you're acting, but that's okay. We seem to be the only one that want to test God and his theories. And that's why we end up broke and divorced and sick and depressed and angry and hateful and spiteful because the God's laws are meant to bless us. Amen. Today I want to declare that we are going to submit to the laws of God from this moment forward and God says that we will have good success and I'm declaring that to every person in this church. I'm declaring that we're going to submit to God, that we're going to submit to his word, we're going to submit to his laws and we will have good success according to his word in spite of what's going out in the world I want to tell you God is still on the throne his laws are still above the laws of man his laws are still above the laws of sickness and disease and if you will be obedient to his word you will have success and not only success good success in your life Amen. Hebrews says without faith it's impossible to please God for he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder and this is where people get hung up. Oh, I believe in God. But you know, many people don't believe God's a rewarder. But the Bible said you must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So God wants you to live with reward, not regret. And God says, if you'll follow my laws, you will have reward and not deal with regret. God said, it's simple. I've got a manufacturer's handbook, a manufacturer's manual. Do what it says and you will not have to live with regret. You will live and walk in reward. Hallelujah. So success is a result of decisions. Decisions based on God's word. Whatever you are right now, you have decided to become. You are Right now, your life is an amalgamation of every decision you've ever made in your life. Right now. So don't blame anyone for your predicament. Don't blame God. Don't blame the devil. Don't blame your husband. Don't blame you are an amalgamation of every decision you've ever made. And success is a result of decisions based on God's word. Success is a result of decisions based on God's Word. Amen. And failure is a result of decisions based against God's Word. Whatever you decide, to decide determines your destiny. You literally become what you decide. And that's why God said true vision determines and has to have discipline. Because if you don't know where you're going, you probably will end up lost. And if you don't believe me, just when I was, you go with a man into a city where he does not know it and take away his garment or all his stuff. And he will think he knows where he's going. He will tell you he knows where he's going. And he will go there until he eventually finds a way out of the mess that he got into because a man is never lost. He's just continually looking for the right road. So ladies, you need to understand, honey, do you know where you are? No, but I'm headed in the right direction. We will never admit we're lost. We can't do that. So that's why scripture says without a vision, the people perish. And what that means is, I'm frustrated. I know God has a plan for my life. Things are working out. And I got to be, if you'll be honest with yourself, how many know that some of the issues we have in life are things that are self-inflicted and decisions we made. God didn't make them. Nobody else made them. We made them. And we get frustrated with God. 
And the Bible says without vision, you'll cast off restraint and you'll make bad decisions going forward. That's why vision determines where you're headed, and you have to have a vision, a God-given vision, to go forward and stay on track. God gives us vision to stay on track with what He's called us to do. Vision and purpose bring clarity and discipline. God's desire is for you to, oh, I need to drive this home. You need to have reward and not regret. Now, I'm going to tell you, everybody in this room, I don't want to show hands, I'll bet you there's some point, some place, at some time, in some action in your life that there was regret. Now, I'm not, I'm, looking, I'm not looking at anybody. I'm looking down. But the reality is God doesn't want us to live with that. He wants us to live in the reward of His Word. So a true friend is someone who will help you put your destiny in drive. A true friend is somebody that will help you get your destiny. And that's why the Bible says that Jesus is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Your greatest friend is not, is not your pastor. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's your greatest friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And I promise you, he'll never give you bad advice. He'll never give you wrong advice. He'll give you heavenly advice, godly advice. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you want to know, is, is this me or is this God, is the devil? If it does not line up with his word, I guarantee it's not Jesus Christ. If it's Jesus Christ, it will line up with every word in the Bible. That's how you know it's God. So, brothers and sisters, when, when the answer is no, guess what? The answer is no. no. Sometimes we told our children no for their protection, right? Yes. Stay away from that fire. Stay away from that Ashley stove. Stay away from that. It'll burn you. It'll hurt you. So, we need to look at how God works in our lives. How many know that your future is God's past? Your future is God's past. I read it to you in Isaiah. Okay, so let's go to work. In other words, God finished you before he started you. How long has he known about you since the foundation of the world? That, that's what we just read in Ephesians. Right? So God finished you before he started you. Hallelujah. God's plan for your life is already finished. Amen. Amen. It is very comforting to know that my life is in the hands of the living God. Amen. It is very comforting to know that my life is in the hands of the living God. Right. And that he has thoughts and plans for me. And that God already has a finished future in my life. That's what we just read in Isaiah. God speaks to the end of a thing and then goes back to the beginning. So God's plan for your life is already finished. He's just believing that you're going to keep his laws to make effect the thoughts and plans he has for your life. And that's where we get in the problem of not keeping his laws and in his ordinances to stay in line with his thoughts and plans for our lives. Remember, brothers and sisters, of all the problems I have had in my life, I am the common denominator of every problem I have ever had. And so are you. So God's laws are to keep us on track with the vision and the thoughts and his plans he has for life. They're not to make our life miserable. They're to bless us. Amen. So God never begins until he's finished. And that's why God never gives up on people. Amen. That's why God never gives up on people. Oh, that's an amen. God hadn't given up on your children because he sees the end. Hallelujah. And then he goes back to the beginning and starts. <laughs> Hallelujah. God never begins until he's finished. The Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. God said it's finished before it even began. Salvation was be finished before it even began. Your redemption was purchased and taken care of in heaven before it even began on earth. Do you understand what I'm telling you? And that's what God has for your life. I know the thoughts and plans I have for you already. God says the, the plans are to prosper you, not to harm you. Can you say amen to that? God doesn't want to harm you. I, I, I've talked with a lot of people. I'm just waiting for God to drop the other shoes. Like, my God, what Bible are you reading? The shoe that dropped was the one you fell and dropped on yourself. My God, don't blame God for that shoe. He says, I, I want to give you hope. We serve the God of all hope. Say, my God is a God of hope. God says, I want to give you a future. God says, I know my plans for you already. Woo, hallelujah. Amen. Some of you are getting it. So God finished you before he started you. Oh, 
Whew, that's good to know. That means I'm a work in progress, and God knows where I am, where I'm at. So when I'm off track, he can send the Holy Spirit to tell me, get back on track. So when you're off track, he can send the pastor of the Holy Spirit or your nosy neighbor lady to come on over to your house and tell you you need to get straightened out. Because she will, I guarantee you. And God told Israel in Isaiah 46, we read this earlier, remember this, put it in your mind, God says. Don't forget it, he told the men of Israel. He told them three things. Remember what I told you. There's no other God like me. There's no God like me. He said, remember that. He said, put it in your mind. And he said, don't ever forget it. And it means the same thing when Jesus said, verily, verily, in the New Testament. Same words in the Hebrew. So God is saying, I need you to understand that I am faithful to my word. I need you to understand that my laws are in effect, and they operate in heaven and in earth. And God said, when you're obedient to my laws, what is in heaven can come into your life. How many know that there's healing in heaven, and God wants to bring it to the earth? How many know that there's success in heaven, and God wants to bring it to your life? Amen. Hallelujah. All right, Lord, they're getting it, so here we can move on. I am God, and there's none like me. No God operates like this. He was telling Israel, all these fake gods and these golden idols, that, he said, they can't even talk, they can't even walk. He said, when you ask them something, they can't even speak to you. But he said, I am God, there's no God like me that speaks to the end of a thing, and then I go back to the beginning and start it. Whew, that's a, that's a mighty God that can do that. That's the God I want to serve. That can speak to Stephen's life, and then go back and ensure that if he abides by my laws, he's going to walk into every thought and plan that I have for him. Whew, that's, hey, man, I praise God for that. He says, I've got guarantee for you. How many like a guarantee? Amen. That's God's word, not mine word. God said, no other God operates like that. There's no God like that in this world. I am God and I always set the end before the beginning and I make known from ancient times what is yet to come. I say my purpose and it will stand. Do you realize the book of Revelations tells us we win? <laughs> Do you know the book of Revelations tells us in spite of the insanity out there, God's people win? How many know that? The book of Revelations, God, I speak ancient things forward. The book of Revelation tells us God wins, we win. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Can you shout amen to that? Amen. So God said, I always set the end before the beginning. I make known ancient times what is yet to come. And that changed my life of knowing that God has set the end from the beginning in my life. And that's why God can stay in harmony with me. And God can look at me. And even when I fail, he knows if I get back up and I get back on track, we're going to finish out the race and the course God has for us in our, in our life. I got news for you. You got children doing whatever they're doing. God ain't freaked out because he knows the end from the beginning. He is not freaked out about your kids, your grandkids, or your neighbors or anything like that. God says, I speak to the end of a thing. I'm sitting in heaven knowing there's a day they're going to come on their knees. My God, there's a day they're coming. And God says, I'm just waiting for it. It's going to happen. And why don't you get in line with that? Quit worrying, quit fretting, start praising me that I see the end from the beginning and I've spoke to that situation. Amen. God said, there's no God like that. No God works like that. That means he, I finish before I start. God says, I complete before I commence. The Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. God said, I finish it before I started it. Oh, hallelujah. I finished your salvation before I even started. I finished your salvation before Jesus even came and was laid in a manger. I finished it in heaven. The Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God said, it's already finished. Now I'm going to start it. God said, your life in me, it's already finished. It's always complete. You're going to accomplish everything I have. Now let's get busy and do it. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So God finishes before he starts. He completes it before he commences it. And that's why when God says, whenever you see me start something, that's evidence that it is finished. Whenever you see God start something, it's evidence that it is finished. When Mary and Joseph looked down in that manger, saw that little baby Jesus there, it was evidence God had already finished it. Oh my God. When they looked in that manger and saw that immaculate conception, guess what? It was evidence God had already finished it. It was evidence that God had already raised him from the dead. When you have an immaculate conception, and I'm going to tell you, we as men, you're going to have to have an angel send an angel to us to tell you that's really what happened. But the reality is, when they looked down at that baby, he was already raised from the dead. Do you understand that? Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. That is good news. God says, I've finished what you're praying for. Start praising me for it. Amen. 
I finished what you're believing for. Start praising me for it. So whenever you see God start it, know that it's already evidence that it's finished. Say with me, I begin and I exist. And here's the good news. God would not allow you to have been conceived in your mother's womb unless there was not something already finished that he had for you to do. Amen. Let me put it this way. God would not allow you to have been covered, conceived in your mother's womb unless there was something already finished that you were born to start. I know the thoughts and plans. Brother and sister, God has thoughts and plans for you. Amen. Not God. God has thoughts and plans for you. That's a life-changing scripture when you get that in your spirit. So I'm going to say this again so you get in your spirit. God would not allow you to have been conceived in your mother's womb unless there was something already finished that you were born to start and complete in Him. Say, I'm here for a reason. I'm here for a reason. You're not a mistake. You are not a mistake, brother and sister. You are. Say, I'm not a mistake. I'm not a mistake. You are a destined baby already finished work of God. God never begins with the beginning. He sets the end and then he begins. So, I got good news for you. Your success is already finished. And what he is saying is, if you will abide by my laws and my statute, your success is guaranteed. Wow! Your success is already finished. God said, just walk into my life, my precepts, my word, and my laws. And God said, it's your success is guaranteed. Yeah. The greatest success in life is raising godly children. So that when you leave here, your deposit in the earth is the righteous seed of God operating in the earth. When we, that's my prayer, that my children will serve God. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That is my prayer, that, that this is the most important thing I can do, is leave godly seed in the earth. And that's what I'm praying for, believing for, and standing for. And I believe it's already finished in God. Then God says, I'll set your end before you, and then we'll get started. I make known the beginning from your end. That's why when you were younger, you were dreaming all the time. That was your destiny screaming at you. Any of you ever fulfill out a destiny of some of the dreams you had when you were younger? Three of you. Anybody ever have a dream? <laughs> Ten of you. That was your destiny screaming at you. Amen. Let me prove it. Do you remember a dream by a guy named Joseph? Anybody know the story of Joseph? What's the first thing that God gave that man? A dream. And it was his destiny screaming at him. Now, God does not fill in all of the particulars along the way to the fulfillment of the dream. But I got news for you. That fulfillment of that dream was good success in the earth, if you don't believe me. Amen. How many believe that what God did for Joseph was good success? Not just success. It was good success. And it all started with a dream that God put in him when he was 17 years old. Hallelujah. So, Joseph, your dream was real. Never judge your destiny by your current misery. Don't judge your future by the misery you're in right now. Never judge your destiny by your current misery, Joseph, David, Daniel, Jonah, Peter, Stephen, Jerry. Never judge. Because what you're saying is, this is the way it's going to finish. And God says, hold it, hold it. You need to understand something. That's a bump along the road. God said, There's, there might be vicissitudes in life, but I've come that we might overcome. We are overcomers in the Lord Jesus Christ. He came that we might overcome. Amen. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. God said, get your mind straight about this. There are issues and vicissitudes of life. And I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, we all go through them. We all go through them. But that doesn't mean God is through with our plan. That doesn't mean God has changed his mind about you. I'm going to tell you something really you need to know. The vicissitudes are an indication that Satan is trying to derail you from God's perfect plan for your life. And the harder the vicissitude, I'm going to tell you, the harder the enemy wants to come against you to derail you in relation to what God has for you. So you're sitting here wondering, why is the devil messing with my kids? He sees the greatness in them that he has for them. Amen. So start praising God that they're on track. They're going to get on track with God. So now I'm going to get into some stuff that... Remember I told you none of you got here by the stork? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to burst... I don't want to burst your bubble. I'm going to tell you, boys, you didn't get here by the stork. You didn't get here by the stork. I'm just going to tell you. 
What's that? <laughs> okay. They already know, trust me. God had a perfect design for you. When were you chosen? Before the foundation of the world. You were chosen when Jesus was chosen. Amen. Woo! <laughs> I'm just preaching word. I'm just the messenger. You were chosen when Jesus was chosen. Amen. I read it to Ephesians and I think Paul knows what he's talking about. Say, I was chosen when Jesus was chosen. I, was chosen when Jesus was chosen. I don't know if you believe that, but you're going to have to argue with the Apostle Paul there in Ephesians. So we need to understand if God chose us, quit feeling sorry about yourself and sorry for yourself. And tell them, I'm here because I'm a winner. Amen. I'm here because God chose me. That's right. So stop telling people you're one in a hundred, you're one in a thousand. You're actually one in a million. Hallelujah. You're actually one in a million. So I'm not going to go into all of the stuff. But we have a total misunderstanding of the process of conception. Psalm 139, 13 says, For you created my innermost being, and you knit me together in my mother's womb. Who did that? God did that. Let me read it again. For you created my innermost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Whew. God was there at your conception. I'm sorry. I know your mommy and daddy thought they were the only ones there, but God was there. But let me tell you something. Okay, I, I, I hate the religious churches about this stuff. Do you know God created sex? Yes. God created it. Yes. And we're afraid to talk about it, and that's why we have so much problem with it in the church. But I got news for you. God created it, and in Fury, Genesis 3, God just openly says, and Adam knew Eve. Yeah. That's King James' version of, of saying, hey, they got it on. The reality is... That's how you got here. And God's not ashamed of it. He is not ashamed of what he created. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what God created. For you created my innermost being. Ooh. You knit me together. Do you know why God hates abortion so much? It's mankind tearing apart what God has knitted in the womb. God says, I hate that. It's mankind going in there and ripping and tearing what God has knit. And so wondrously and marvelously. And the Hebrew word is knit. Like a, your grandma sitting there knitting a blanket. The Hebrew word is God said, I'm going to go in and I knit. God knitted you, son. You were chosen. He knitted you exactly. I got news for you. God was there when you, showed, when you got. Yeah. God was there, buddy. And he started knitting you because he chose you. Oh, that is important for you to know. You were chosen before the foundation of the world. And God said, on the night you were conceived, or whenever you were conceived, God said, I'm going to show up because I'm going to start knitting somebody I chose. And the reality is God chooses everybody, but they just do not abide by his laws and walk into his precepts to the plan that God had. Everybody is predestined to be saved. Everybody is predestined to be saved. Whosoever will, God said, whosoever believes on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. Amen. So God showed up tonight. Or the day. Or wherever. <laughs> Scripture says God saw you in your mother's womb. And he began knitting. Wow. How many of you think you're children or something? Wow. And you were there when they got conceived. And you're a child of God. He was there when you got conceived. He was there. He was there. He was there. I promise you he was there. And he began knitting. So, God was there. Your parents thought they were alone. We act like this. Well, God, God you know, he, how, do you believe God's omnipresent? Yes. How many believe God's omnipresent? So, on the night I was conceived, I guarantee you, God didn't say to Jesus, Oh, don't look, Jesus, don't look, Jesus, don't look, Jesus. Oh, my God. Are they, okay, now you can look. My God, he created it. He's not afraid of it. Don't you look, Jesus. My goodness. 
I'm tired of religious that doesn't take, talk the truth about the reality of how we were conceived. And that God was there, and that's why he hates abortion. Because he said, I showed up and I knit it. I got news for you. Every conception is immaculate because God shows up and begins his knitting in the process in the mother's womb. And that's why you are an immaculate conception because God showed up. You, oh, hallelujah. And all the Catholics said amen. All the Catholics, amen. That's how important you are to God. You were chosen before the foundation of the world. And God said, oh, tonight, tonight's the night. <laughs> I can see Johnny Mathis is on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come down. Hallelujah. And God began knitting. Because he wanted you. He wanted you. He wanted you. No, no, no. Because in the release, uh, release of the seed, there's many, many seed, I'm telling you. All trying to get to that egg. But God's like, mm, mm, I want Stephen. That, that ain't Stephen. That's a, a, there, God said, I want that one. That's you, Randy. God specifically chose you. He specifically chose you and you and you and you and you. How many of you think your children are wonderful? And you had a hand in producing them? And now you know how God feels about his children. He had a hand in producing them. Because he showed up at the night or the day at the time you were conceived in conception. That's what your Bible says. I was there when I was conceived, God said. I was there. Now you know why abortion is so horrible to God. Man tearing up what God has done. That's why David said, I am wondrously and marvelously made. David said, I don't have a microscope to know what's going on, but something magical is going on in there. Can you say amen? Amen. <laughs> So as far as the baby is concerned, God don't care whether it's in wedlock or out of wedlock. I, I got news for you. I hate the term illegitimate child. You ever heard that term illegitimate child? I got news for you. The baby's never illegitimate. The parents might be, but the baby is legitimate. Because God showed up in the process. You are wondrously and marvelously made. There's no illegitimate baby, maybe illegitimate parents. And God will deal with that. I got news for you. You can pray and ask God to forgive you and move on. And I, I, some of the greatest men of God I know are men that were born out of wedlock. Even women that were born out of wedlock. And God has used them mightily. I got news. That don't freak God out. That don't freak God out. I'm not endorsing that. I'm just telling you. It doesn't freak God out. And your God's blood is bigger than the sin of any fornication or anything men can do. So I don't care if it's in wedlock, out of, lock, out of wedlock, under the lock, beside the lock. God said, I'm going to show up and I'm going to begin knitting. I'm God. I'm the creator. And I'm going to knit you together. And I want you. I want that one. I always ask God, why, why, didn't, couldn't you make me taller? <laughs> Goodness. And God said, it's time for you to come, Stephen, because my plan for you begins now. Because I've already written your story. Your end has already been written. Your life, the finished product of what your life is going to be. He said, but I'm going to come back to the start where you began. And I'm going to start it myself. And then we're going to walk into the destiny I have for you. Trust me, I didn't want to be a preacher. Trust me. I never wanted to be a preacher. I told God, I will never be a preacher. He just laughed. <laughs> Oh, come on, give him some praise. That's how you got started. God knit you together. He knit you. He wasn't freaked out. Oh, Jesus, don't you go. He's like, okay, I've got a baby to knit. I'll tell you one of the revelations I've got in my life is God loves babies. I, I did not know to the extent that God loves babies, but God loves babies. I'm going to tell you, one of the greatest things I ever was, it was, it was a brother who talked about going to heaven. He talked about all the aborted babies and where they were. They're all around the throne of God. And God told him, I love babies. Your God loves life. He's the creator of life. Satan is death and destruction. God is the God of life. Let there be light. Let there be life. So before I formed thee, I knew thee in the belly. And before you came as forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. God has a plan for you. You've been sanctified before you. God was working on you before you even got here. I ordain thee. You're chosen by God to do his word. He chose you out. Wow. And the good news, brothers and sisters, it's already finished. Say, he's the author, he's the author. and the finisher, the finisher. 
Of my faith. Woo, I praise God. Because that tells me I'm still a work in progress and God hadn't given up on me. Saying, Christ, it's already finished. So when the abortion issue today, the discussion today, or people, they talk about pre-choice, they talk about, they talk about cho uh, pro-life, pro-choice. I don't believe any of that. I believe in pre-choice. I believe I was chosen before the foundation of the world. I, I believe that God pre-chose me. I believe that God pre-chose you. I believe in pre-choice. That's what I believe. I believe that God had a plan for me before the foundation of the world. I know God had a plan for you for the foundation of the world. I know God had a plan for you before the foundation. When did God begin to think about you? Before the foundation of the world. You must be important. You must be somebody to God. He must love you. He must care about you. And his desire is so much so that he sent his son to die. So that we could be restored to relationship and walk into the plan he has for our life. That is exciting to me. That changed my life to know that, God, you have a plan for me and it started before the foundation. I'm that important to you? Say, I'm important to God. Important. He's been thinking about you for a long time. God's been thinking for you as long as he's been thinking about the lamb slain before the foundation. Say with me, it is, finished. it is finished. The work of God is finished. I just need to get in line with the finished product. I just need to get a, into operation with his laws and his word. And that's why I'm saying I, I believe that we in living faith and around the, uh, around the church in America, I believe that God is calling people back to his laws and to his ordinances and to his ways so we can step into the fullness of what he has for us. Amen. I know the thoughts and plans I have for you. That was an amen through a mask. Hallelujah. I praise God for that. <laughs> so there's people here today waiting. What are you waiting for? It's already finished. Today I'm asking you to get in agreement with God's word of whatever you're praying for, believing for, standing for, crying about, whining about, whatever you're doing about with it. I, I want you to know it's finished. Say it's finished. it's finished. Now start living like it. Now start praising like it. Now start praying like it. Now start going around. And so next time you see him, say, it's finished. I don't got to worry about it, cry about it, fret about it. I have given it to God. It is finished. Hallelujah. Amen. I've seen God do amazing things. With people that I thought could never change. And then I saw God just move miraculously. And do a mighty work in their lives. So God is saying, get in line with my word. I'm your manufacturer. Don't put orange juice in your gas tank. Don't put syrup in your gas tank. Don't stick potatoes up pe uh, people's tailpipe. Well, I shouldn't talk about that. <laughs> Some friends of mine told me about that. I'm telling you, I'm a work in progress. <laughs> I have been all my life. So, this is why God says, I want you to understand my laws and my precepts, they bring good success. Because in this world that we're living in right now, I know that as I talk to people and, and I see issue, this the issue of fear, the issue of doubt, the issue of uncertainty, I just want to share with you, if God has a finished story for your life, which he does, that's bigger than COVID-19. So this is what God says. Paul says, I'm going to pray right now that you get this, of how great a salvation God has for you. God says, I have plans for you. How many of you have plans for your life and realize that as you planned out your life, you undershot what God had for you? Am I the only one here that's ever undershot God? Do you know I found out I undershot shoot God about 75%? But I want you to get that mindset and I want you to throw it out today and I want you to get a new mindset that says he is able to abundantly above all I could ask, think, or hope. That's what the word of God says, so let's read it. Paul says, I pray you get this in your spirit. 
For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom the whole family of heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. In the what? In the inner man. That's what God was knitting when he was there in your mother's womb. The inner man. David said, he made my inner post, inner parts. That's what David said. Hallelujah. God was working on my inner man when I was in my mother's womb. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you may be rooted and grounded in love. And what that really means is understanding how much God loves you so you can pass that love on to other people. That's what, that, that's what rooted means. Because root is what gives fruit. There's no fruit without a root, okay? So God's saying, if you get rooted in love and understand the love I've given you, it's easy for you to give that love to other people. That's another sermon for another time. He might be able to comprehend that God says, I want you to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, and the depth, and the height. Y'all think your kids are wonderful? God says, man, I want you to understand how much I think about you. The breadth, the length, the depth, the height of what? That Christ may dwell in you and you understand in this. That ye may know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with the fullness of God. And now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to his riches in glory. Except if there's COVID-19. So this is what God's word says. That whatever you're believing for, God says, I'm going to do abundantly above all that you could ask, think, or hope. That you could ask, think, or hope. Wow. God said, my laws will bring good success. Brothers and sisters, when we obey God's laws, it brings success. When we obey God's laws, he brings good success. And that's what God has for you. God wants you to live with reward, not regret. Say with me, God wants reward in my life? God wants reward in my life. Not regret. Not regret. Amen. Amen. It's hot. I'm done. <laughs> Whoa, I got sweat in my eyes. Stand for, the, stand for the blessing, if you will. Whoa. Randy, is that air conditioning on? <laughs> wow. This is God's word to you. This is God's holy word. God, above, abundantly, y'all, you could ask, think, or hope. The way you think about your children, just you can put that on steroids with the way God thinks about you. He's been thinking about you since the beginning. So God says, here's my heart. The Lord bless you and keep you. Adonai, bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. It means the Lord's smiling on you. Think about that. God is smiling on you today. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace, the peace of heaven that passeth understanding. And then God told Israel, put my holy name on your children and watch what I do. And watch what I do. Because the work is finished, says the Lord God. Start praising me and giving me glory. Because I have a work that's in process. I see it finished. So I'm relaxing. You start relaxing and trust me with it. If you believe it, say amen. amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Hello, one and all. We have been receiving questions regarding where to send tithes and offerings. If you'd like to mail it in, you can do so at P.O. Box 2223, Sholo, Arizona, 85902. And please, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, share, and subscribe. Helps out us, helps out the channel, and most importantly, shows that this is a format you wish to see continue.